You're listening to Sprott Money's Monthly Wrap-Up with Craig Hemke. Welcome back to the Sprott Money News Monthly Wrap-Up, a new feature here at Sprott Money News. I'm your host, Craig Hemke. This is your monthly wrap-up for August 2021. And joining us this month is Connor O'Brien. You may not know Connor, but I can assure you Eric Sprott does. He's a business partner and confidant of Eric's. And so with Eric absent, uh, it's great to have Connor sit in. Uh, Connor, thank you so much for your time. Well, uh, Craig, I really appreciate uh, you having me on. Uh, Obviously, with uh, gold and silver prices doing what they're doing, it's very uh, difficult to figure out what might be next. That's (laughs) that's for sure. I was (laughs) joking on uh, Twitter earlier this week that... uh, I've been uh, running TF Metals Report for 12 years. It feels like in gold years, it feels like 24 or 36. Um, yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd say 48 to 72. Yeah, yeah, I think that's probably accurate <laughs> as well. And I see right. that every time I look in the mirror. Um, hey, and before we get started, just to remind everybody, uh, whether you're here for the Ask the Expert segments or the uh, monthly precious metals projections with Chris Vermeulen, where we'll have another one of those probably in the next week or so, or now these monthly wrap-ups. Please always remember that Sprott Money is the sponsor of this content. If you could do anything as a thank you for that, shoot us a like or a subscribe on whichever channel that you listen to this on, uh, because that'll help us spread the word. Additionally, though, Sprott Money is a bullion dealer. So we are always uh, happy to offer great deals on physical gold and silver and also storage of said physical gold and silver. Premiums have come down a little, and actually now those new, really newly designed American Silver Eagles are starting to become available soon too. So please be sure to visit SprottMoney.com, or of course pick up the phone and call them at 888-861-0775. It is August the 26th, Thursday the August 26th, as I'm speaking with Connor. Late in the morning, about noon Eastern, we are now within 24 hours of uh, Chairman Powell's speech at the uh, Jackson Hole Symposium, something everybody's been waiting uh, and eagerly anticipating now for quite some time. Just in the last week, we've had all kinds of uh, Fed goons kind of flipping back and forth, talking about, well, you know, I'm, I'm a, I think we should taper. No, we shouldn't taper. Well, I know I was in charge. I was in favor of taper just two days ago, but now I'm in, not in favor. I mean, it's like all designed to be confusing, like back in the Greenspan days. Um, Connor, we're within a day of this, though, and it's going to be an important announcement, whatever Powell has to say. What, what's on your radar, and, and uh, what are you expecting? Well, Craig, uh, it all feels like it's coming to a head, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> well, and you said uh, earlier just in your uh, introduction there about physical and the premiums coming down in it, and it's funny that it is doing that in the United States, but I just read this morning that uh, in Germany, where uh, German real yields trade at minus four and a quarter, and that's on 10 years, that it, the physical gold demand is the highest since 2009 for bars and coins. So they're obviously getting the picture there when you, when you buy uh, German boons that you are out minus 4.26% as soon as you do. And that's the stated rate of inflation. We all know that inflation is probably a little bit higher than that. Uh, And in terms of uh, where we're at uh, coming with tomorrow, obviously everybody's very, very uh, concerned with what Powell would say or is going to say, but they have a lot to deal with. And I mean a lot. Uh, You you look at the market, the S&P 500 making 50 all-time new highs this year. There's uh, clearly no problem there. But what is that predicated upon? Well, when central banks buy $875 million every single hour since COVID, uh, and you watch the ECB balance sheet or the U.S. Fed's balance sheet, and you overlay it over the German DAX or the S&P 500, they correlate pretty well. So uh, what do they do? in order to combat what is today? Well, they've got two problems, one of which is inflation. And obviously, it's on every investor's mind. The inflation problem is uh, 
Food prices are up 31% year over year. That's a UN calculation, the United Nations. And then you look at input prices, output prices, just about every respondent will tell you in surveys that input prices and output prices are way up year over year. Uh, you look at um, core PCE this morning, uh, up 6.1%. And the last time I checked that the Fed's target was 2%. Mm -hmm. So you're ticking a little higher, even on their calculations, <laughs> which we all know that the CPI data or PCE data is vastly understated. Uh, so they've got inflation to deal with, number one. The, um, the, the next problem that they have to deal with, uh, the other half of the uh, stagflation argument, is stagnation. You start to see the city surprise <laughs> index, uh, which is ultimately just a, an index when, when uh, data comes in positive, the city surprise index generally will tick to the positive. And what the data has been saying uh, at the beginning of COVID was minus 150 on the city surprise index because obviously all the data was coming in very negative. Now things turned around rapidly, uh, rebounded to plus 275. And everybody thought, hey, this is great. What a great response by the Fed. But now all of a sudden, the data is kind of turning weak again. And so the city surprise index is now at minus 50, okay? So you have that problem, but also you get the services PMI, which peaked out at 70 and now ticking at 55. You get the New York Fed, who's now downgraded uh, Q3 GDP down to 3.5%. You got Goldman, who's downgraded GDP uh, for 2022 down to 1.5% to 2.5%. So... They also have the stagnation thing to deal with. Yep. So here's the thing. The Fed can't deal with both of them. They have to choose one. And so far, they've been choosing the stagnation route. Uh, and I believe will continue to do so. And I'll be shocked to hear them do kind of anything else. We'll see, we'll see where it ends up from there. But kind of that's the, uh, the view for tomorrow. Hey, let's um, <clears throat> let's turn the tables on them a little bit, Connor. Would would you say that given all that uncertainty and with the city surprise index turning lower and all this PMIs turning, all the stuff we're seeing, the stagnant part of the stagflation? Uh, like I said, let's turn the tables on them. Do you think anything that Powell says tomorrow, um, any policy change he notes, is just transitory? Well, I, I mean, transitory is now sadly turning into permanent and sustained. Uh, so he, he can sit there and say transitory all he wants, but banks like Bank of America would sadly disagree with him. Yeah. I mean, you, you kind of look at the stuff that they've been putting out. They no longer think anything's transitory. Uh, so he's obviously going to have to answer to that question. It's the last question that they, they actually want to deal with because you know that Powell is a dove and that he would ultimately like to continue upon this path of buying 120 billion of uh, mortgage-backed securities and whatever else they're throwing out into the mix there too. I mean, we all know that they, they're in the market buying tips. That too, I mean, just kind of when does it end? Right, So, right. Well, again, I wonder if uh, their, their policy is now transitory too. They're gonna say maybe taper and then they won't, you know, and that sort of thing, we'll see. And in the end, it has certainly impacted the metals and the shares as we've gone through this year. It seems that uh, institutional investors, hedge funds, the like, uh, have been shunning gold, at least gold futures, silver too, uh, buying the dollar. And the shares have just had a miserable year. Uh, yeah. As we transition to just kind of the shares in general, Connor, how do you, I mean, we watched the GDX come all the way back down to what seemed to be a pretty important support level between 31 and 32. The GDXJ is breaking down. What From 37,000 yeah. feet, how does it look to you? Well, starting from, I guess, a little bit of a uh, micro perspective, okay, that from the run uh, from 1,200 to 2,100, there was a lot of companies in between those goalposts that needed money. <laughs> so a lot of money was raised. Uh, a lot of companies got their money. But now that you see the gold market kind of 
uh, unwind some of that froth, you would have called it maybe, or somebody would have called it, maybe not us, at 2100. Uh, you start to see investors kind of take off uh, that money, knowing that uh, there are other places that look better. The NASDAQ certainly goes up almost daily. The perspective from gold investors is that they've generally kind of given up. And, but that was the opposite of what it was at 2100. So I think that you're at a spot now that a lot of the froth has been taken out. A lot of the people who have bought the financings have either kind of given up or uh, they've kept a very small position, but generally the sellers have probably sold to stronger hands like ours. For an example, we haven't gone anywhere. We were perfectly uh, wary of the risks uh, above 2100, but we were also uh, very eager at 1280 and especially at 1350 when gold started to break out. So we know that uh, gold and silver are very inherent with uh, cyclicality like that. Uh, Obviously, with the Fed doing kind of what it does on a a monthly basis, that uh, it continues to keep investors' eyes out elsewhere. You know, the the old man always likes to say, you know, you got to be able to have a party in the room by yourself. It certainly feels like we're back to that point. Yes, uh, undoubtedly. Undoubtedly. I'll tell you, Mike, Craig, that my phone was probably one of the more popular phones in Canada. For a time, as gold was rallying, plenty of financing is coming. I was the busiest guy in the world. And now you won't hear the phone ringing in the background of this call <laughs> for, and probably won't ring for the rest of the day. Right, right. Now, you well, know, all of a sudden, yeah, go ahead. No, that's fine. Connor, let's, uh, let's kind of wrap up with some individual equities that uh, you might just kind of give some thoughts on or any, any direction you want to go. When, I, when Sprout Money put out that you were going to be the guest this month, We had some people write in and say, you know, we very much enjoyed uh, the weekly wrap up back in the day. And Eric used to talk about companies like Tudor. Uh, Somebody mentioned Free Gold. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on those, but also uh, the last time I spoke with Eric, he was very excited about Newfoundland and basically buying almost 20 percent of anything to get his hands on up there. So I'll just let you take it from there and share with us whatever you can. All right. Sure. So let's start with the first one, Tudor Gold. Uh, So. There's 30 million ounces on its way to 50 sitting there in BC and 50 million ounces. Let's say that the gold price is 2000. You've got a a hundred billion of gross metal value sitting there. The market cap of Tudor is, isn't anywhere close to that. And I'm not saying anything that uh, the gross metal value should equal its market cap, but it definitely remains a very attractive stock uh, for us. And, and we're, very, very happy to be sticking with it. The, the management team has done a wonderful job. Uh, and uh, I, I would suggest that either t- Tudor should be accumulated down here. I would suggest that a lot of the froth, again, has been taken out of that. There's obviously been some financings done on the way, uh, again. But I, I, Tudor, I would be very much sticking with here, without question. Free Gold was another one that was mentioned. Oh, Free, free Gold Ventures. Okay. So Free Gold Ventures... Uh, how we look at it, like the market kind of thinks of free gold as a uh, low grade ore body in Alaska. They've already got proven up 6 million ounces at call it a gram. Okay. But like, let's look at the latest drill hole, uh, which was uh, 495 meters by 1.17 grams. Okay. Now one, one, a gram as uh, Eric has taught me many times over, in terms of its profitability in comparison to high grade, high grade, uh, and we'll go through some of the section uh, of free golds, but so one gram, but in, within that hole, you've got 3.6 meters of 26 grams, three meters of 35, three meters of 20, and then three meters of 21. So, let's take that for an average, call that 25 grams. The difference in profitability for 25 grams and one gram, well, just in, and also you have to think of it this way. So one gram isn't your profit. You would call 0.2 your profit. 
So let's take it from 25 and then take a gram off of that. We'll call it 24. Well, the profitability in terms of the delta there is 120 times different. So we kind of are very hopeful for free gold that there is a much bigger high grade story and a much more profitable high grade story there. The length of it dilutes it. Is that, am I looking at that the right way? Yeah, correct. Okay. Correct. And they, correct. aren't they in Alaska, Connor? And they are. They yeah, are. They're so. right. They're, they're right beside Fort Knox, uh, Ala Kinross, who would be a natural acquirer, one would think. And mm-hmm. especially if a high grade uh, system ends up being proven out. Like if they end up having, let's say 15 million ounces, but you've got four to 5 million ounces at call it 20 to 25 grams a ton. Believe me, there will be uh, eyes looking at it. Yeah. So we, we definitely are sticking with free gold. And uh, I just think that the market at the moment just kind of misunderstands it in terms of the way that we see it. And let's wrap up with Newfoundland, since Eric was so excited about it uh, a couple of months ago. I know he's friends, good friends with Dr. Henny, and I know Dr. Henny sure is excited about it. And there are individual companies that, I mean, you can mention if you, if you want or not, you know, sure. whether it's Labrador or Newfound Gold or Socomon. Yeah. Um, yeah. just in terms of, you know, this potential, uh, region, you know, this whole area up there, is it still something you guys are looking into? It, it is uh, priority number one, two, and three. <laughs> I would just say that when you get like the hole that I read from free gold, okay, that's one thing, but then you get newfound gold, which has 19 meters of 92.9 grams per ton Jeez. and another hole of 25.6 meters of 146 grams per ton. Like th- that is on a level of ridiculous. So basically, basically what we did was we frantically searched the province and picked up just about anything that we could. Uh, like for an example, a can star was a, uh, what would we buy that out? It must've been a $20 million market cap. All of a sudden you hear that they've got eight holes with VG in them of 22. You kind of think to yourself, whoa, wait a minute here. Uh, 20 million could turn into a 400 million market cap pretty easily. Okay, well, let's buy that. Okay, sold. Move on to the next one. Uh, Then you get something like uh, Cantera Minerals. Here's another good example. Very, very small market cap. But guess who their neighbor is? Marathon Gold. And they sit on the uh, Valentine Lake deformation zone. They've got 5 million ounces of gold already and probably moving higher than that. But guess who Cantera is? It's their neighbor to the north and they sit on the Valentine Lake deformation zone. So do you pick up that market cap at 14 million? Yes, you do. Okay, sold to us. Okay, so I, and I can give you one more, uh, Vulcan Minerals. The market cap of that has, is $19 million. And within that company, they own something called Red Moon. And now it's a salt asset. However, Red Moon is a publicly listed company with a $55 million market cap and they own 39% of it. And that's $21 million. So basically you get a whole bunch of their other exploration assets in the most prospective place on earth, as far as we're concerned for nothing. Right. So you buy Vulcan minerals. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Jeez. What an example <laughs> of being in the room by yourself. I, and, and, uh, absolutely. And we feel as though that we're still the only ones in the room at the moment yeah. in Newfoundland. So We'll take it. We'll see how everything uh, shakes out. But it's a very exciting time in Newfoundland, undoubtedly. Yeah. And when you think about this kind of illusionary year that we've been in, you know, we're, as you mentioned, negative real rates don't seem to matter, at least, even though they've mattered for decades, all of a sudden this year they don't. Uh, And this illusion, you know, that again, the Fed is going to taper and draw down the balance sheet, you know, that game they played for five years. Once that wears off, and it will wear off, man, is there going to be interest not only in the metals, but in these mining shares again? So it sure seems wise you continue to pre-position yourselves. That's for sure. Anything else on your mind, Connor, before we wrap up? I would just say that stick with it. The gold and silver trade is certainly not dead. <laughs> that you've yeah. had, uh, obviously, the, the shares haven't uh, cooperated from the GDX and GDXJ perspective uh, and their incumbents. But you definitely have to look in other areas. You might not find that uh, buying those particular equities are suitable to you. You might have to look other places, which uh, we've done fairly successfully here. And uh, we're certainly hopeful 
for the latter, call it third of the year. Uh, once we get a few, you know, kind of fed moments out of the way uh, and we'll see where we land from there. Yep. I hear you. Great stuff. Again, we've been speaking with Connor O'Brien, who's a business partner of Eric Sprott's. Talks to him every day, works with him every day. Um, good to get your perspective, Connor. Man, I tell you, really, really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, I, I'll just leave it with this, that Eric says hi to everybody. I was out with him uh, yesterday having a beer or two, and uh, he's still excited very much so about the future for uh, gold and silver investors, and uh, all the best to you. I know there are a lot of people listening that would have loved to have been at that table with you two, myself included, I can tell you <laughs> that. But I can't come to Canada at this. I don't think they're letting Americans in. So yeah. uh, I think we'd have to be there virtually. But anyway, Connor, thank yeah. you. And again, just a reminder on the way out, uh, if, if you appreciate this content, thank Sprott Money for it by stopping by their site, taking a look at the precious metal they have to offer, their storage options, uh, and of course, very helpful customer service that can be found anytime, 888-861-0775. Connor O'Brien, thank you very much for joining me this month. You got it, Craig. It was a lot of fun. And from all of us at Sprott Money News and SprottMoney.com, thank you for listening. We'll talk to you again next month.